Um, but what better time to have a webinar that is titled Dangerous Minds, What Makes Terrorists Tick? Uh, so going beyond just the indoctrination or the obvious fact that terrorists are angry about something and have a political cause, we want to dive deeper into the psychology, the environment uh, that someone grows up in or is living in, uh, and try to figure out what, what's the common thread here between this increasingly diverse array of terrorist enemies that we face? Um, is there a way that we can address all of them at once since they all seem to thrive off of each other? So uh, I'm very excited for this webinar. I want to thank um, some, several of our partners that made it happen and wouldn't be happening without them. Uh, Combat Anti-Semitism, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, Canadian Citizens Against Terrorism, also known as CCAT, Canadian Security Research Group, and the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Thank you guys very much for your support and making this webinar happen. And the expert we're bringing in today has really unique insight into the topic, what makes terrorists tick? tick. Uh, so Nafis Hamid is a fellow at the Artists International uh, Organization, A-R-T-I-S, an associate fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism, uh, and a whole bunch of other fancy titles. Uh, you can look up his bio uh, so that we don't go on and on forever. But what really makes him unique um, in the ocean of terrorism experts and specialists out there is his really unique work uh, at the University of Barcelona where he worked with neuroscientists uh, to conduct the first ever brain scan studies of jihadist supporters. So he can tell us what's going on in the brains of these terrorists uh, on a scientific level, and then also obviously on a psychological and social level as well. So Nafis, thanks so much for joining our uh, webinar today. Thanks for having me, I'm happy to be here. Sure thing. So let, let's start off with the recent news. Uh, let's talk about what happened in Washington DC. Obviously there's a lot of commentary out there. A lot of it's predictable. Uh, I'm sure you have observations that you're not seeing in the mainstream media that's just focused on the political back and forth um, and, and just kind of beating the same drum over and over again. So can you give us some deeper thoughts about what the significance is of the insurrection that happened in Washington, DC? Well, I think there's a couple things that, that I've been noticing about the, the coverage related to that issue that, um, that I feel like my research might be able to contribute to. Um, one thing is just the fact that people are kind of pitting these different potential explanations against each other. Some people are saying, you know, it was Donald Trump's rhetoric. He kind of got the audience riled up. Other people were saying there may have been some core group of people who were pre-planning this attack. Um, there was weak security involved at, at uh, Capitol Hill. There was, um, there was sort of a mob mentality that just kind of got out of control. And everyone's trying to figure out sort of based off of their politics or sort of which group they're aligned with, which is their favorite explanation of what happened. Um, but the truth is you don't need to pit any of these things against each other. I mean, they're, they're, they're all contributing. And one thing that in psychology we talk about is the difference between propensity and motivation. And propensity is something that, I mean, it's kind of linked to what we normally call radicalization. It's basically, all the things that build up over time, the change in someone's identity, the change in their values, their perception and their in, in, in the threat that they feel towards themselves or their group, um, all the things that maybe take days, weeks, months, even years to actually build up in a person. However, if a person has a high propensity to, to act in a certain way, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to, to do anything. Uh, there's vastly more people who support white nationalist ideology, jihadist ideology, what have you, who, who aren't doing anything at all. And it's only a small number of people who actually act. And it's the same thing that comes out of criminology. You see that there's a lot of people who may have the propensity to, to carry out some crime, like a serial uh, uh, thief or something, but even that serial thief is gonna wait for an opportunity. They have to actually see a, a phone sitting unattended to on a, on a table somewhere before they're actually gonna steal it. So while they may have the propensity, uh, you can't actually see anything different between them, a thief and a non-thief just walking down the street. It's only when they have an actual opportunity, then the opportunity creates a sort of motivation. That's something that's more in the moment um, that, that gives them the affordance to actually act out on their 
propensity. So I would say, you know, if you want to talk about QAnon or conspiracy theories or everything that Trump was saying about how, how uh, democratic rights were being violated and so forth, that's building up propensity over time. Uh, and then the, the motivation comes uh, because of lack of security, uh, because there's a mob mentality, and maybe because there was a few people in the group who were actually leading the charge who may have or may not have pre-planned things. And so you don't, so all of these things contribute as long as you just understand that you got to understand that human behavior kind of comes out of these two, the, 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 these two general categories of propensity and motivation. So that, that's one thing. Go ahead. Did you want to say something about that? Uh, well, what I was going to ask is, would it be correct to say from a response standpoint, if you're trying to say uh, what elements of the radicalization process do you target uh, specifically in the case of like Washington, D.C., which is fascinating because I do think you had a preconceived terrorist attack. Uh, it, it seemed in some ways similar to what happened in Benghazi, um, because anything that is considered a rally or a protest is operationally a good fit for someone who's planning a terrorist attack. Um, and so uh, for me, I, I would say, is it accurate? Yeah, let me put it this way. It, it, is it accurate to say there's almost two levels of radicalization that happen for this type of attack, which is there's that general radicalization that comes from the conspiracy theories, the apocalyptic rhetoric that makes people believe that essentially America is about to end and therefore what was previously not justified can now become justified because of the circumstances of the situation and the crisis. But then there's also that other element of radicalization that takes people who believe in those things, but then there's like a spark or like you said, an opportunity that then makes them go operational and actually carry out an attack. Am I missing anything in there? Well, I, it, I mean, it really it depends on how you want to define radicalization. So the way I define radicalization is is propensity, because I believe it's about the it, it's not about the social circumstances. It's about the individual. It's about the individual's um, likelihood of behaving in a particular way given a particular circumstance. So someone can have a criminal propensity. Someone can have a a um, you know helpful propensity. You know, there are some people if someone falls down, if they see someone fall down on the street, are more likely than other people to stop what they're doing to go help that person back up or something. You know, so you have good Samaritan propensity, you have criminal propensity, you have violent political uh, propensity. So I link all of that as just being radicalization. I would say there's way more radicalized people than there are people who are acting. And then I would refer to the motivation, what you're referring to, the spark, that that the affordance is the opportunity to actually act as the situational contingencies um, that take a propensity and turn it into an action, basically. So if you're looking from like a response point of view, I mean, so again, like if you're talking prevention, there's kind of two kinds of prevention. There's prevention of radicalization, which is how do you stop people from gaining that propensity in the first place? And that can be with messaging or, you know, um, you know, in terms of stopping certain messages from getting certain kinds of people. Um, and then you have the prevention of the actual act itself, which is separate, you know, which would be more prevention of terrorism or prevention of, of uh, political violence, which would be less about how to stop people from getting these ideas into their head, gaining the propensity in the first place, but even if they have it to mitigate, uh, lower the chances that they'll act on it um, by providing adequate security or other forms of um, situational disincentives that will uh, stop, their stop their propensity from turning into an action. Mm -hmm. So like after the attack in DC, it's easy to condemn the people that committed the attack, uh, people who justify or advocate specifically for an act of violence or something like that. Um, but as you said, it, it's a problem that has to focus on an individual, um, but to what degree is someone with the propensity or the motivation influenced by those around them or those they come in contact with? Like to what degree is this entirely the result of an individual's own you know, temptation or inclination to be violent or to be hateful? And to what degree is it the responsibility of family members, friends, or society as a whole, because we're all on social media, for that environment? Because to me, what you saw happen in DC isn't that far removed from what our political environment has become more generally. And if we're being honest with ourselves, every single one of us who is a public figure 
contributed to that in some way. Uh, we all have to be humble about that, I think. Um, so to what degree would you say that individuals who carry out terrorist attacks are influenced by society or individuals around them? Yeah, I mean, an and, and individual, especially from social psychology perspective, is, is always sort of the dependent variable. Um, yes, of course, there are genetic influences, but even that's a dependent. I mean, you don't have control over your genes. Um, but yeah, nobody's genetically predetermined to become a criminal or a terrorist or do anything bad. Um, there are some genetic um, predispositions that maybe make someone uh, have a little bit less emotional regulation or self-control or um, if, if they have certain genetic predispositions that if they were highly abused as a child, that makes them much more likely to engage in violent behavior later on. But again, those are all kind of still outside factors. You're not in control of your genes. You're not in control of your childhood and the kind of upbringing that you had. Um, so the individual is always sort of seen as a, as a dependent variable. Now, legally speaking, I think that we do have to bring in this idea of agency that individual people do have volition and self-control and that we have to hold individual people accountable legally for what they did. And that's why you're hearing news about people being arrested who are related to those uh, riots who stole government equipment or destroyed government equipment. And I think that that's really important that we not deny the agency of individual people, especially from a legal point of view. Um, but from a policy point of view, if we stand back and reflect on, yes, I mean, people are products of their, of their environment. And, uh, and we also have to know another thing that I was going to say about, the, um, about what happened there and what I think is going to continue to happen. I mean, the FBI just put out some warnings that, you know, more, uh, more riots are being planned across the nation leading up to and on Inauguration Day. Um, all political movements are made up of a, of a, of a diversity of individuals. And um, as we saw, even on the day of the rights, there were people who were protecting the police officers, for example. There were people who were, there was an AP uh, journalist who was being beaten and there was a Trump supporter who, who pulled that person out. And uh, there were people who were telling others, other people in that riot, telling people to stop doing what they were doing. So you have a variety of people in any movement. Uh, people join any political movement for a variety of motivations. Um, I've been interviewing people who joined the jihadist movement, white nationalists, people who've joined QAnon. You see it's the wide spectrum of, of, of personalities and, and reasons for actually joining. Uh, but the thing is a movement, the backbone of any political movement, and this is peaceful movements as well, are really a group of people that we call in, 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 in my organization, Artists International, as uh, devoted actors. Uh, devoted actors are these people who in any movement are saying, I'm willing to make extreme costly sacrifices for the cause of my movement. Now, devoted actors don't have to be violent people. People who followed Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or MLK Jr. were all devoted actors of those movements. They weren't taking other people's lives, but they were willing to get injured themselves. They were willing to get, go to jail. They were willing to engage in hunger strikes. They were willing to lose their lives in some cases, because they believed so strongly in their cause. And any movement that you have, if you don't have this group of devoted actors sort of as the base of the organization, uh, you'll find that generally this group will basically just wither apart. Uh, what, what, what really keeps any movement sustained and, 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 and trucking along are those devoted actors. And of course, the kinds of actions they engage in, the kinds of sacrifices they engage in, depends entirely on the ideology of that movement. So if you're part of a nonviolent movement, you'll engage in civil disobedience where you'll allow yourself to get hurt a lot. However, if you're part of a, a movement that believes explicitly in terrorism, you'll, you'll kill other people as part of your costly sacrifice. And so I do believe there are strong devoted actors uh, within this, I don't, I don't even know what we would call this, this, this movement now of these people who are out there uh, rioting and Trump's support. I don't, I don't know what the, what, the, what the label is gonna be for them yet, but they clearly are devoted actors within that movement who are willing to get arrested, who are willing to, to probably kill other people. Um, as we know, there were armed people with, with weapons, people are talking about wanting to hang Mike Pence, uh, walking around the Capitol building. Uh, you know, so, so there are violent actors within that movement. And so for me and my colleagues, the question was, well, what are the key components of devoted actors, regardless of the movement? What is it that, what makes a devoted actor? How do they get created? What are the, what are the key elements of a devoted actor? 
And it was important to, to, to even mention before I even get into this, a devoted actor doesn't necessarily have to be a leader. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're very intelligent people, very eloquent, uh, they, can be, they can take on leadership positions, they can become strategists. But I mean, a suicide bomber, for example, would not be someone who's in a leadership role oftentimes, and yet nonetheless is still a devoted actor of a movement as long as they're not being coerced, basically, as long as they, 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 they do it willingly. So one key element of a devoted actor is something that we call sacred values. Uh, these are values that are, that are moral values that are considered of the utmost importance to people. Um, and they vary from, from, from group to group. So and they don't have to be religious, even though the word sacred is in there. Um, but like jihadists believe in a caliphate or strict Sharia, that would be sacred values for them. White nationalists, white nationalists would believe in an ethno state or remigration of minorities. Um, and, uh, and the truth is, you know, uh, the, the, the American revolutionaries all believed in, uh, in, in sacred values of freedom of speech and equality before the law and free and fair elections. In fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson's original writing was not, um, we hold these values to be self-evident. It was, we hold these values to be sacred. And then it was argued amongst the founding fathers, we should change that language as too much of a religious connotation. So they took it out. Um, so, so even liberal democratic values can be held as being sacred. And what I think has been happening uh, through conspiracy movements, through things like QAnon, as well as through uh, Donald Trump, has been he's, been, he's been playing on this idea of the fact that there are many Americans who still do believe in the sacredness of democracy, who believe in the sacredness of election. And he's convinced many of them that there actually is a secret bipartisan government, you know, a, a covert operation that took place that went in and actually changed the, the election, changed the vote count in order to oust him and bring Joe Biden in. And so we have to remember this, this is an ideological movement. These people yeah. believe and the reason you can't find evidence like that uh, to that degree is because they're so secret. So it becomes like this really difficult thing to argue with. And I don't mean like minor cases of voter fraud, but people make it sound like a plot like that is so easy. Like if you just say, well, it was hacking, a cyber attack, that answers all questions. You don't need to scrutinize it any further because you don't need to provide evidence because you just found some link, uh, purported link to something electronic, therefore it was hacked. And uh, it's, evidence is actually left behind when, when there are cyber attacks. That's why countries have hacking back and forth and retaliatory measures why there's investigations. It's not like pushing a couple of buttons and then you don't know who did it. So, so that you know, people understand. Um, but uh, on that topic of what you're describing about these kind of like echo chambers that are necessary for this alternate reality be, to be created, um, I'm always debating in my mind these proposals about taking people off of Twitter. I know in terms of ISIS, it was very effective. Um, once Twitter learned how to do it the right way so that the second it start, someone started spreading ISIS propaganda, their account was shut down. It did make it harder for them to network. Um, but now it seems to be going more broad than that. I mean, obviously, the president was taken off of uh, Twitter. I believe he was just suspended from YouTube. Parler was taken down, which Parler granted a total hotbed of radicalization. We were monitoring it. Uh, so I can understand the logic saying, well, that's where the hate speech and the incitement's coming from, let's just remove it. But then on the other hand, you also disperse the suspects. It's not like shooting fish in a barrel anymore where you can just watch them all congregate in one spot. Now you have all sorts of encrypted chats. There'll be a whole series of other places that they meet and it's gonna become harder to track them. And the more they go into that echo chamber, the harder it is to prevent or to prevent radicalization or detect it, reverse it because you now push them somewhere where their echo chamber just got reinforced. At least on Twitter, you can have trolls coming in and being like, hey, that's stupid. Uh, but you're not gonna be having that in a place like Parler or one of these encrypted chats, uh, especially if they require approval in order to accept you into the group. So Nafiz, wh where do you stand on that? Does it make sense to, when people are spreading conspiracy theories and hysteria to just ban them from places like Twitter? Or is there a middle approach? What do you think is, is really the right approach? And does this help radicalize people more or does it help stem radicalization? 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's something I've thought a lot about over the years, and to be honest, I'm I'm still sort of evolving in my thinking because it's such it's such a nuanced issue because there's costs and benefits to every policy. Um, when you when, when they were allowing people like on 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 people were, people were affiliated with ISIS or Al Nusra or whatever just to freely roam all over Twitter, I mean, the benefit to them was that they were able to find all sorts of people who maybe never had come in contact with those ideas before that they could start building relationships with. They could flood social media with their ideas. They could normalize some of their ideas. They can create even the perception that they're a much larger group than they actually are and that they have a lot more support than they actually do. So so getting them kicked off of all of those platforms did have that added advantage that now they're kind of at least just talking to themselves. It's kind of like what they were dealing with in prisons as well. When you had uh, returning foreign fighters, they were afraid that they were going to radicalize other people in the prison. So some people thought, well, what if we just put them all in one prison where they're all together? They're already radicalized. Sure, they'll continue to radicalize each other more, I guess. But if they're just they're just there for the rest of their lives or, or however long, I mean, who cares? They're not really built, bringing in new recruits. And so that's the added advantage. But of course... This is not a prison. Uh, these people who are, even if you push them off to another, to a Telegram channel, to, to I think Parler was kicked off its web server. And I believe that they're going to just go onto another web server probably and be back up and running. I believe it's a Russian one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so them and, you know, Vcontact Day, I'm sure, will continue to get more support. I mean, you already have a lot of American white nationalists on Vcontact Day. Um, so, yeah, they probably will migrate to another uh, platform. And so the danger is, while, while they may have a harder time now recruiting random people on Facebook or Twitter that they could have come in contact with as easily or on YouTube, even in the comments section, um, they it probably will give them more of a feeling of like this is our little virtual caliphate now or something you know where they're all plotting and planning things together and can be co-radicalizing each other and well increasing each other's propensity to actually act and do something um the prison situation was different because they couldn't really do anything they're they're, they're still in prison i mean so even if they're radicalizing each other more and more there, there's no outlet for their actions however and if you kind of put them on one platform and they radicalize each other more and more, they're still free members of society and they can actually go out there and do something. So there, there is a danger. Um, yeah, I, I do think some sort of middle approach needs to be had where you don't push them so far that even intelligence agencies or police can't track them and that there's no ability to actually get in contact. Um, but if you could move them onto a platform where you can at least try to get a diversity of ideas going, counter arguments to people who don't, um, but, but basically break open those echo chambers in some way. Uh, the people who are always gonna have the greatest vector of influence over any extremist are the people who are as close to that extremist ideology, but just don't believe in the violence or, or sort of the more hateful parts of it. So the idea that some of these people who are doing these riots will be on a platform with other somewhat like-minded people uh, who let's say are in parlor um, is not actually, a, it's, it's, it, it could be an opportunity. Let's put it that way. It could be an opportunity if there is a way to leverage the, the nonviolent voices within parlor to engage with these people, to um, demotivate them from, from, from engaging in any action. But that will depend entirely on parlor and sort of their own algorithms and how they, um, how they sort of manage or mismanage the creation of these echo chambers. And a lot of people are, are going after Parler and I understand why, but understand Facebook and, and Twitter, how their business model radicalizes people. I, I think I'm actually kind of shocked that the, this isn't getting more attention. So remember the days on Facebook, which I much preferred where they just showed you in the news feed the activity of your friends. And it might be some guy that you knew back in high school, but in a way you felt connected to him because you saw, oh, he just got married or something like that. Um, but then they changed it because their business model to have an algorithm that spits, you, spits back more of what you want. So then you end up seeing the same 50 people over and over again. And then as news got involved, sources of information got involved, well, you start liking those posts. Now that gets spit back at you. Now you're getting introduced to other sources of information and literally, this isn't an exaggeration. It's happened to us and people that we know. 
Uh, if you're someone who is, say, pretending to be an ISIS member or an ISIS member yourself, and you're looking for jihadist type propaganda, so you set up an Instagram account or a Facebook account and you start liking anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, you start liking accounts linked to ISIS. Well, now the system, the social media company starts spitting that back at you. And in some cases will recommend friends for you. So now they just connected you to like-minded radicals and distributed terrorist propaganda for you and your cause. And so a lot of this, from my perspective, comes down to those algorithms, which there's all sorts of non-terrorist related consequences to this for civil society, just by feeding people the propaganda to justify their point of view and make them feel smart as if they've gotten everything figured out in the world. That's just horribly damaging to society that I think it just needs more attention. Uh, those algorithms are extremely dangerous and poisonous to society on multiple levels, very relevant to our conversation, I think, about radicalization. So you can go after individual social media companies, but the ones that all of us innocent people are going to, I think, even play a bigger role than Parler and, and places like that. Now, Nafiz, when you were doing some of your research um, with the neuroscientists, um, I know that the case study focused on jihadists. Would the results from that study also be applicable to the other types of extremists that we're dealing with, like those that took part in the DC attacks? Yeah, I think so. Um, so again, so what, what you have with jihadists or, or most forms of people who are joining violent extremist groups is usually there's a there's, there's a group of people. There's, there's usually people who have some sort of need, some sort of suffering going on in their life. Um, for example, there was there was a guy that I'm talking to right now who's a member of QAnon, uh, and he was talking about how he he's he's he has a real anxiety. He has a problem with, with with dealing with the uncertainty of life. He has strong anxiety issues. It's always been a problem for him. He always needs to have a contingency plan for almost everything. And after doing some 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 conversation with him, he finally kind of said, "He goes, listen, maybe all the stuff that I believe in is wrong." but at least believing in it allows me to have contingency plans that I can make because the real world. That to you. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he was, he was a very self-aware uh, person. And a lot of these people actually are when you, when you start talking to them, especially when they realize like I'm a cognitive scientist, that I'm they're not talking to a journalist. I'm trying to get to a deeper level. They then eventually start to psychoanalyze themselves basically. And they start huh. feeling quite interesting. When I think of QAnon fans, I, I don't think of self-aware. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. I mean, a lot of even the ISIS guys that I, I mean, it, it, they vary, you know, I mean, again, like there's no one personality type. There's, there are some people who are very self-aware and, and this person was, and uh, he was saying that he, he said, he was like, if the world really is so complicated and so uncertain and there's so many moving parts and it's so chaotic and you have to become an expert on every single thing on economics and public health and tax codes and whatever to be able to have a coherent understanding of what's going on in the world, I don't have the time for that. That is gonna cause me anxiety. I don't wanna deal with that world. Um, and the truth is look, we're living in a world where you're getting access to more and more information, right? As humans, it may not even, there, there has been arguments made that evolutionarily, we're not meant to have or have so much access to information right at our fingertips, mm. where we're seeing all this injustice happening all over the world, we're seeing all these problems. And so it's a kind of information overload. And some people can handle that information overload more than other people. And there may be neurological reasons or reasons with upbringing or other factors that may make people more comfortable with uncertainty. But he certainly was not one of those people who was comfortable with uncertainty. He said, basically he says, I don't have agency either way. I can't change the world either way. So I have an option of two realities to believe in. One that leads to a lot of anxiety for me, or one that makes me feel like I can breathe easily because there's a plan, there's this cabal that's out there, they're doing all these things. I can, I can navigate that world. I can make preparations for that world. I can build contingencies for that world. So believing in the conspiracy theory was actually almost good for his mental health in terms of just being able to get on with his day and get on with his life uh, because it, it, it reduced the complexity, reduced the uncertainty uh, and, and, and made it sort of a more palatable and, and easy world to understand. And oftentimes- well, when I say, These are like <laughs> apocalyptic ideologies. Like if you believe in QAnon, the world's already a scary place. But if you believe in the QAnon theory or, or jihadist ide ideology or anything else like that, the world's a lot scarier. It's like the world's about to end. There's going to be millions of people dead if you and your comrades don't stop it. 
So if you're anxious about the world and your future, what would draw you to an apocalyptic type ideology that I think would increase your anxiety? So I would say there's two things. One is, um, is that I think people generally would rather live in an evil world than a chaotic world. Uh, they would rather they believe that they're on this ship with some captain that they don't like who's, who doesn't, who's malevolent to them than to believe they're actually just completely lost at sea and that there's no one steering this boat. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a human impulse. And the other thing is that I believe that, this, that these ideologies do give people somewhat a sense of agency because if you can point out exactly where the evil is and, and that you could say that there's a cornerstone to all the problems in the world, that there's a center of gravity, and if we can just figure out what that central problem is and just target it and go after it, then we're all going to live in a wonderful utopic reality on the other end of that, then that motivates people. There's some agency there. You can, you can, re you can reduce all the world's problems to the cabal or the infidel or multiculturalism or whatever you, whatever you want to posit as being the enemy. And I mean, by the way, I mean, there's a reason why you have a lot of people on the left in the spiritual community, left-wing spiritual groups who are also joining QAnon as well, because they also, a lot of them tend to believe in these ideologies. I mean, I was talking to a couple, uh, a couple, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend who live together were QAnon supporters. Both of them are yoga teachers. They're very spiritual. They believe in, uh, you know, crystals, being able to heal all sorts of medical issues, very left-wing. Um, and yet they believe in all this QAnon stuff because even there, there's this ideology of the, of the meta crisis, which is this idea that there is a, there's a meta problem in the world and all the various problems that we're dealing with from health issues to, to, to nuclear war, whatever, they all come down to this one factor. And if we can just deal with that one factor, then everything will still sort of be this um, knock-on effect and it'll make the world better in, in a large way. So again, this, this calms people down. It creates a clear pathway for action for them if they can actually just pinpoint what the problem is. And it can give them some agency if they choose to get involved more deeply into the group. It can give them a sense of purpose and meaning to be part of this band of brothers and sisters who are gonna go out and instead of being a victim, a helpless victim of the system, now they get to be a revolutionary against it. You know, just as one French um, jihadist that I met, a guy who, who joined ISIS, he said, you know, like I, I had a choice, uh, go work in a, as, as a bagger in a grocery store, bagging people's groceries and just being a victim of this corrupt system that I'm a part of, or to rise up and become a revolutionary against it. Um, so, you know, again, a lot of times you have like the kind of Luke Skywalker hero's journey sort of narrative playing into it as well, where these, these, these narratives, these extremist ideologies give people a chance to, as I oftentimes say, press reset on the video game of life and to come back as a better character. Uh, where, where, you know, their role in society as it is may be quite low ranking, but if they join this other movement, now all of a sudden they're a more high ranking member, uh, they're a mujahid, they're a revolutionary, they're a researcher, as the, the QAnons call themselves. Um, so those are all the Before, before I, get, I get into the neuroscience study, mm -hmm. um, I just want to get your thoughts on something. One of the commonalities that I've seen when I've engaged extremists, um, either in person or through online intelligence gathering, is that they're all like the worst know-it-alls. Uh, I mean, they have the answer. They're an economic expert. They're an expert on construction, on all, anything and everything. And they have all the answers. And it's always done with that really snobby tone where it's like, where they'll say, yeah, yeah, you make a good point, but I have sources, I can't talk about them. Or they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're listening to the media. You're one of those, you're being played. Let me tell you the truth. And it's about everything. It, and it, it drives me crazy. It makes it, it's not just difficult to deal with, um, but it makes it really hard to come up with a strategy against because they're so convinced that they're a genius who has figured out the most complex things in the world. Um, and, and that's why sometimes the people that you see on Facebook or you've even met in school who are just like in the classroom, the kid that's always raising his hand sometimes as an answer for everything. And you say, well, he's really smart, but he's also a big know-it-all will end up adopting really illogical, nonsensical ideas because there's just such arrogance there. And they want to be the guy that's always correcting everyone. Like their fringe belief appeals to them 
because then if you disagree with everyone, you can correct everybody. Um, so my question to you is, is that based on your study, does that happen before the ideology really seeps in? Is that like a personality feature or is it that they're like kind of normal, humble, then they adopt these ideologies and then they become this massive know-it-all? I think it depends. And, and there's also like a, a selection issue there where the ones who are the more know-it-all ones are probably the ones who are more likely to engage with people online, be more ostentatious, actually cooperate and be interviewed and so forth. So you're going to see a lot of those personalities. I do know people who went and joined uh, some of these various extremist groups who were kind of more humble, but those people were not the ones who were leading the charge in terms of joining the group. Usually those were the followers within a network. Um, those were the best friend or the younger brother or someone of, of, of someone else who's, who's kind of got hooked into this movement and started to go down this pathway. And usually that, that leader will then bring in other friends with him or her into that movement who might be a little bit more, you know, quiet in terms of their personality, a bit more humble. Um, and even, even someone who's, who's very vulnerable actually, where, where this particular group of friends for them, like for example, one of the Paris attackers, the, the, the Bataclan attackers, well, I mean, he was part of the network. He actually carried out his attack in, in Brussels, was well known in Molenbeek as just being this guy who could easily get bullied, easily get pushed around. And that core group of friends of his who then went from Molenbeek in Brussels and went to Syria and carried out these attacks were really his sort of protection mechanism. And so once they started to go down that pathway, he was obviously gonna get sucked in with them. So I would say that personalities really, really do vary in terms of you have outgoing people, you have extroverts, you have leaders, um, you have followers, you have all those different kinds of people. Um, I, I don't know if there's a particular personality feature that makes someone susceptible before getting radicalized. I would hypothesize, and I think there's some pretty, there's, there's some, I wouldn't say compelling, but there's some reasonably reasonable evidence um, that, that, that can indicate that maybe a need for certainty as, as a quality might be really crucial for getting pulled into these movements where you want to have the black and white. You want to have, you need to have the answer. You can't just deal, you can't say, I don't know easily. You can't just say, oh, the world's a complicated place. There's a lot of gray areas. Who knows? There's a lot of moral ambiguity. You need that specifically moral certainty on things. Um, that there's, there might be a certain personality type that needs that who might be more susceptible than other people. But of course, they still have to be exposed to the ideology. They still have to have other reasons for wanting to leave one moral community behind and join another moral community. There has to be life circumstances that are making that more um, more appealing to them as well. So our research kind of steps in more at that level at the neuroscience, which is what are the factors that are happening around someone at the time that they're about to join a group or about to carry out an attack that can either push them further down the pathway to violence or pull them away from it. Okay, so um, unless you've already gone over it, um, can you kind of tell us what the results were of the neuroscience study that you were a part of? Yeah, so we did a couple studies. Um, so one of them was, so it all took place in, in Barcelona in Spain. Uh, and the first study was looking for basically fairly, fairly early stage radicalized people. We're looking to understand what is it that, what is it that maybe takes someone who has some vague sentiments or values that are um, that are sympathetic to a violent extremist movement and then makes them sort of more extreme. So with the help of a bunch of research assistants, we designed a survey. I went and collected the data and it was about close to 500. Maybe it was even over 500 surveys that was done just with that population. It was the Moroccan origin population in, in the Barcelona region. You, you mean, was, I'm sorry, you mean it was based on 500 um, jihadists? No, 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 sorry. No, this is 500 surveys from the, from the broader community. So we, we kind of knew where the hotspots were. So, so Spain is usually ranked in the top three countries for radicalization related to jihadism in, a, in Europe. The Barcelona region is the number one area where most of these people come from. And then within that, there's specific neighborhoods that you can go to where you're much more likely to find people who have 
sympathies for 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 these groups. It's still it's still a tiny minority. So we were really highly targeting exactly where we knew we were likely to meet someone who might have sympathies for this for this group. And so then we go out with surveys, and based off the surveys, we're able to sort of figure out um, out of that 500 who might be the most susceptible to radicalization, who sort of shows the most sympathy. And so we didn't get a lot of people into the scanner from, from an fMRI point of view. It's actually a, a decent normal size for a brain imaging study. Uh, we got 38 people who said that they basically supported a, jihad, a cause championed by jihadist groups. So it could have been a resurrection of a caliphate or strict Sharia being implemented in all, in all territories in the world, uh, a support for armed jihad. It could have been a variety of issues. And not only did they support the cause, they even said that they were personally willing to do something violent in defense of that cause. So these aren't full-throated you know, members of Al-Qaeda or ISIS here, uh, but these are people who basically have, we would say, sympathetic on some level. They have some background values or attitudes that are sympathetic to the cause. And then what we do is we, we bring them to the facility and uh, one by one, and uh, for half the participants, we, 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 well, we played for all the participants, we played this game called Cyberball. Cyberball is a, is a game that's used oftentimes in social psychology experiments, where it's just, it's a video game, basically. It's you tossing a ball to three other players. Now, the other three players, this Moroccan origin participant could see, or was convinced that they were Spanish players, were, were, were white, ethnically, ethnically white Spanish players. Uh, who were playing this video game with them, but they were in separate rooms. They didn't actually exist, but the person thought that they were sitting there in separate rooms. They could see the picture of the person and their name and everything. And they would toss the ball back and forth to each other. And so you have one condition, which is called the inclusion condition, the control condition, where they pass the ball to the other players, the other players pass the ball back to them. Half the participants were in the exclusion condition where they would pass the ball. And then after about 15 seconds or so, the three white Spanish players would just start passing the balls amongst themselves and exclude the, uh, the, the Moroccan player. Now you would think that this is just kind of a small little silly experiment that won't have a real big impact, but this has been used throughout psychology experiments and hundreds of experiments around the world. And unconsciously at the level of the brain it has a huge impact on inducing feelings of social exclusion. And you can see that through brain imaging, you can see it through saliva tests, you can see it through um, 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 surveys they fill out afterwards. So we have a variety of manipulation checks and we saw that this actually, this, manipul this experimental manipulation really did work, really did make them feel socially excluded. Then we put them in a scanner, fMRI brain imaging scanner, um, which is just a giant magnetic tube you go in. And basically what that tells you is uh, where blood is flowing in the brain. And from that, what parts of the brain you're using more of versus less of, what parts of the brain are more active, what parts of the brain are, are, are less active. Or, or, or even kind of offline, if you will. And what we found was, um, we found an area of the brain that was associated with sacred values in two previous studies done with American populations. So one thing was nice about the study was it was a third replication of sort of a particular area of the brain, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a second, um, that activates for sacred values. What was interesting though, was that the participants who were socially excluded when they were ranking, so so they, they would go into they would go into the scanner. They would look up on a screen, and in the screen they could see the value. They could see whatever they could see various values that were either sacred or non sacred to them that we knew from a battery of psychometric tests we gave them, which varied from person to person. So they could say Palestinians have a right of return. There should be strict Sharia. There should be a caliphate. It could be any number of like 25, 30 different values that were shown that were being shown to them. Then we asked them on a scale of one to seven, how much are you willing to fight and die for these values? And what we found across the board is uh, obviously sacred values had more willingness to fight and die. People were more willing to fight and die for those values than their non-sacred values, it's more important. Not, nothing particularly surprising about that. What was interesting though, was the participants who were socially excluded, now their non-sacred values, when they were processing their values that were not sacred to them, that were not these kind of do or die values, all of a sudden the brain area that was before only associated with sacred values now came online for non-sacred values. And their, will, their explicit willingness to fight and die for their non-sacred values started to approach sacred values level. And when we took them out of the scanner and we had them reevaluate which values were sacred or non-sacred, we could start seeing values that were in the non-sacred column moving into the sacred column. 
And so what we basically saw was that social exclusion was leading to basically more radicalization at both at a neural level and a behavioral level. You saw values that were um, be previously in the, in the category of values you could negotiate with someone on, the category of values you could persuade someone on, the category of values that someone's willing to engage with on some sort of rational level. Now, all of a sudden, those values are going into the sacred column, which means you're not going to be able to persuade them or negotiate with those values. And now they're willing to become devoted actors for those values. And that's a very dangerous um, move because if a person has no non-sacred values, now you have you have no leverage over that person. You have no you have no value within their ideological structure that can sort of be the thread that you can pull that might hopefully unravel the whole thing over a long period of time. You have nothing now. And so what we found was uh, social exclusion because most people I think have multiple identities, multiple values, especially these, these kids who were, who were in this study, these were not fully radicalized people. People before they get fully radicalized and fully join a group, they, they're, they're straddling multiple identities. And so you have a chance to leverage any of those other identities, other groups that they're a part of to pull them into one group versus another. But when they felt that social exclusion, they doubled down basically on the, on the antagonistic group, the group that antagonizes the group that's excluding them. Um, so that's what we found in that first uh, neuroimaging study, that the importance of social exclusion in terms of taking people who are pretty much at an early stage of radicalization and how rapidly it can just ramp someone up very quickly from being kind of a, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of having low propensity to now having much higher propensity to becoming a devoted actor. But that's interesting because you would think that as they're more and more on the fringe and they're excluded, they may want to moderate um, their views um, or, it, or just become more flexible in order to appeal to greater people, a greater amount of people because people naturally want to be with other people. No one likes being the loser. No one likes to be the person in his mom's basement that doesn't talk to anybody, you know? And so you would think that as they're excluded that their views would bend in order to become more attractive to those that were excluding them. But what you're actually seeing is that they double down on the views that would help get them excluded in the first place, right? Yeah, I, I, think, if people, I think if people feel like there's a pathway back from exclusion, you know, that, that, that there is a way that they can get welcomed into the tribe or the group or whatever that they wanna get welcomed into, even if they want to get welcomed into that group, they might take that, but if they feel that there's an, ex or if they perceive that there is an explicit rejection, an explicit social rejection by the group, then that's a very different, that's that's a very different factor you're dealing with now, because and now it's they're an equivocal thinking, rejection, like it, it's a, yeah. it's not a rejection that's conditions based. So oh, I'll modify what I'm doing. It's like an unequivocal rejection. So. Yeah. the possibility of changing yourself to have greater appeal is, is no longer viewed as possible in their mind. Am I? Yeah. yeah I, think, I think it's, yeah, they, they, they feel that I am being rejected for who I am, you know, not necessarily what I'm doing here. Okay. And, and that leads to a, that leads to a lot more vengefulness, basically, you know, a sense of I'll show them, I'll make them pay. And if you already have access to a group that's basically telling you, come join us, we're gonna make them pay. And you know, you, you, you already adopted at least some of the, you have at least some sympathies with that group. And then you feel that social rejection from people. Yeah, you're much more likely mm -hmm. to then go join that, that group. And now we found, you know, even the, the, the neuro, we understand how the mechanism uh, or one of the mechanisms at play, which is that social rejection can lead to moving non-sacred values, values of much lower importance into this, into this uh, category of values that makes someone a devoted actor and pushes them closer to the brink of violence. But then the second question then becomes after you find that, you find, okay, so social exclusion can really push someone closer to the edge of violence, make them much more likely to become a devoted actor of, of, of a particular movement that says that they're gonna stand up for them and then push back against those who are excluding them. But what do you do with the people who are very far radicalized, who are ex explicitly supportive of these groups? This is not some vague sympathies, this is full-throated support. 
So for that, we, we, we found another 30, this is from another survey study, we also did in the Barcelona region, this time with the Pakistani community. Uh, and, and, and this was, we found about 30 supporters of Lashkari Taiba. Lashkari Taiba is a um, jihadist group based in Pakistan that fights mostly on the Kashmiri issue, but they are an associate of Al-Qaeda as well. They carried out a, the 2008, I believe, Hotel Taj attacks in Mumbai. And, uh, and, and just so you know, there's, there's, there, there is a historical network between Lashkari Taiba as well as Pakistani Taliban and Barcelona. So there is a, there's a well-known drug trade between you know, the, poppy, the, the poppy fields in Afghanistan, which then get processed in Pakistan, which then gets put on cargo ships in China, and they're brought to the port of Barcelona, then those drugs are then distributed and sold throughout all of Europe. Um, and then some of that money makes its way all the way back to the jihadist groups in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Um, some of it becomes part of the terrorist Hawalla system, which is Hawalla is basically like an ancient Western Union in, in the Middle East, and is still being used quite regularly for for mostly uh, you know non criminal means. But there is a terrorist Hawalla system as well, and. Um, and, and, and so they have them. So they have these networks of supporters who are mostly involved in the drug trade. Now, can I say that the 30 people whose brains I scanned, who I found in Barcelona were, you know, card carrying members of Lashkari Taiba? No, I can't. But they explicitly said in the survey that they are supporters of Lashkari Taiba. They support armed jihad against the West. They would be willing to carry out an act of terrorism against the West. Um, they they were just clicking every ticking every single thing possible to show that they really did believe in all of this ideology that they supported that group specifically and that they were ready to carry out violence in defense of that group or or other groups like it. Um, so just to even get someone to explicitly say that is already kind of shocking enough, and then getting them <laughs> to agree to get their brain scanned was a whole nother uh, step. And of course, there was a lot of promises of anonymity and a lot of security and host country authorization to. To, to do this in a safe way. But eventually we did get them into the brain scanner and we scanned their brains. And so now we have a very highly radicalized group of people um, inside the scanner. And what we found with them is when, when they were processing their sacred values, uh, a part of their brain, it's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, it's, it's part of the brain that's up here and it's basically involved with executive functions. It's, it's gonna help you with self-control. It's gonna help you with problem solving. It's gonna help you with deliberative reasoning. It's gonna help you with self-reflection. This part of the brain was deactivated when they were processing their sacred values. So it was kind of offline, the deliberative reasoning and self-reflection part of the brain was offline for their sacred values. Uh, now, there's another part of the brain that stayed online, which is called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It's right here in the, in the middle of your brain, and that's the sort of subjective valuation part of your brain. That's the part of your brain that decides, um, what do I want to do? It's kind of like, what, what, what are my impulses, essentially? So the analogy that I always give to people is most of the time in all of our daily lives, these two parts of the brain are working together. So you go out for dinner, you have a nice big meal, you know, the waiter brings a dessert menu, you see a nice tiramisu on there, you want to eat it. And that's the VMPFC. That's the I want part of the brain. That looks good. I want that. But then you might think, I, I lost a lot of calories. I worked out this morning. I'm going to work out tomorrow. Shouldn't do it. That's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that deliberative self-reflection part of the brain. These two parts of the brain work in tandem to come to a decision. Sometimes the I want part wins out. Sometimes the, the more deliberative part wins out. Now, what we found is when people had high willingness to fight and die for the sacred values, this part was deactivated, the deliberation, the part of the brain that's associated with deliberation. And we did not see any connectivity between that part of the brain and the sort of I want subjective valuation part of the brain. Essentially, you have one driver now in the car who has control of the, of the vehicle, which is the impulse, the, the, the what do I want to do right now? And uh, we knew that when they had, they had non-sacred values and when it was low willingness to fight and die, that part of the brain is active and, and the two were working in tandem. So what we did is what they, they, they evaluated all of their values. So we saw that, and so there was a second part of the experiment where they just were now looking at the value again and they, were, they pressed a button and they could see how they rated their willingness to fight and die for that issue. 
And then they could press another button and they could see what the broader Pakistani community in Barcelona said to that same question. So now they're getting a peer influence, not necessarily other lashkar e taiba members, but just kind of the broader community, their broader ethnic group who live around them, their neighbors, if you will. Uh, what they basically think of, about their willingness to fight and die for this issue. And we had, and the condition was either the, the, the community agreed with them in terms of their willingness to fight and die, you know, you can martyr yourself for this value, or it was less than them. It was it had lower willingness to fight and die. We wanted to have a third condition of higher willingness to fight and die, but these guys were so extreme, we were getting ceiling effects, so they were already at like the top margin of our scale, so we couldn't actually implement that third condition. Mm -hmm. And so we had these two conditions, so they could see that. And now what happened was something very interesting. What we found was that when people saw that their peers, their neighbors basically, uh, had a lower willingness to fight and die than they had, uh, the part of the brain that was offline, the part of the brain that was offline, the, the part related to deliberative reasoning and self-reflection, that part of the brain came back online when they saw that their peers, their neighbors don't agree with their level of violence. All of a sudden the deliberation and parts of the brain related to self-reflection comes back online. And then we found that in a, in, 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 a, in a second evaluation, they lowered their willingness to fight and die to match their peers. When they asked them to reevaluate, they now said, okay, I'm willing to go low. And they went low enough that it was back in the area where their two brain areas were now reconnected and talking to each other again, if you will. So just through Okay, so it's freezing on my end. I'm assuming it's freezing for everybody else. The guys in my uh, studio will probably let me know in a second, but we'll try to get in a few. He's frozen. Okay. So what we will do is we'll maybe just wait 30 seconds. Let's see if we can get Nafiz back. Uh, if we can't, it's close to the wrap up time anyway. Um, so you won't have missed out on really anything. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the studies that he's done, we will contact him um, and you can contact us and we'll send you the link um, because if you're like me and really, really interested in this stuff, you definitely wanna actually read the document and the observations and the correlations between the brain activity, the peer situation and uh, the radicalization. So, and he's back. Hey, sorry about that. So, <laughs> technical difficulties. So, no um, yeah, so you were you're saying uh, that as the radicalized individual realized that his peers had a lower willingness to die, uh, that it actually lowered the radicals also willingness to die. Yeah. Um, is that correct? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Overall, when you're answering that, can you kind of explain to us what those studies tell us about what needs to be done either by the U.S. government or society as a whole in order to push back against this extremism that really seems to be increasing in all of its variants? Yeah, so I mean, I think the first one's pretty obvious, right? I mean, uh, a lot of people, you know, when, when they see their friends or family members becoming supporting some group that they that they don't agree with, whether there are people who think the riots on the Capitol Hill were, 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 were good or supporting jihadist groups, will say, I don't want to talk to this person. This person repulses me and disgusts me. The first thing which is don't do that. Don't excommunicate these people who are extremists because you, you need to, because that's one less social tie that that person has outside of their little echo chamber of their extremist network. So you're actually a very important node in that person's network, stay connected. Don't necessarily fight with them on social media, you know, don't fight with them in the comments section of, of, of Facebook or whatever, because now, now you're just, uh, you know, priming performative behavior because you're essentially publicly humiliating them in front of other mm. people. If you do that, switch to DM, get on Zoom, you know, after this pandemic, get, meet with them, face-to-face -face if you can, uh, people join these groups oftentimes because there is a need that is being met by these groups in terms of a sense for community and purpose and belonging. And by cutting them out of your life, you're only making them feel like they belong even less and are more likely to fall victim to these groups. Mm -hmm. So stay connected, provide more of the sort of psychosocial needs that they may have. And the more you and other people around them can provide, can, can provide those needs for the person, the less they are reliant on that extremist group for those needs to be fulfilled. And therefore the less attractive a lot of those ideas are. The second study I think points to, in a related way, the importance of, of, of social norms when it comes to uh, mitigating extremist behavior. It's very difficult to change someone's values. And we did not change anyone's, we did not 
change anyone's sacred values in, in any of these studies. But what we did show is that you could actually lower someone's willingness to engage in violent behavior, even though you may not be able to change their ideology directly. And for that, peer feedback about what they think their peers think is very important. So again, if you are, if, if, if an extremist considers you one of their peers, that's really important that you make your voice heard, not that you necessarily denounce or try to de-radicalize the person, but that you certainly don't agree with the value systems. And what governments can do in terms of strategic communications, for example, is instead of funding counter messaging that's kind of more you know, public service announcement style uh, uh, messaging that just seems to go after the ideology directly, instead, if you can do things like uh, entertainment-based programs to help ship, shape the uh, social norms that the person believes uh, that the broader community believes in, and that can also uh, lower their propensity to violence. And this has been shown in, uh, in, in Rwanda, as well as the DRC, um, by, by other researchers like Elizabeth Pollack, that radio programs, soap operas, you know, television shows, movies, these kinds of things actually have a profound effect on people changing people's perceptions of social norms and changes their actual behavior towards other groups. And the funny thing is in the study in the DRC, what they found is that these debate programs that we have on CNN and Fox News and MSNBC actually only made the problem worse because what those- uh, Important what those, point. <laughs> Maybe you need to say it again so people, uh, hear that. And I'm someone who has engaged in those types of programs. Yeah. Um, but I've, I think debates just overall should just be discouraged. Replace it with dialogue. That's why these long form podcasts like Joe Rogan's even will be more popular and people will learn are more likely to learn from a Joe Rogan podcast where he's just asking questions and it's not screaming in this predictable, you know, two camps, like two rival sports teams. More people learn from him than they would learn from like a crossfire type program today. So um, yeah, I like that point. So sorry to interrupt, but it's worth repeating it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and what, what makes it so, so bad for society is it basically normalizes that if you disagree with someone politically, you don't really have to listen to them. You can just kind of wait for your opportunity to, you can kind of listen to them in bad faith and basically listen to them throw their talking points at you and then you throw your talking points back at them. And as long as each of you have your quips back and forth, then you don't need to come to any sort of resolution whatsoever in the conversation. And that only, you know, that is terrible for deliberative democracy. Um, whereas if you had, like you said, these long form conversations that instead normalizes very other, completely different forms of dialogue, which is there should be listening in good faith, really trying to not straw man the other person's arguments, um, empathize with their point of view on things, really engage with it and entertain their ideas and try to come to some sort of reconciliation or resolution about the ideas, or at least know exactly where and why you disagree in a respectful way. That will actually do much more to promote the kinds of social norms that are absolutely necessary for a heterogeneous multicultural society, or even one that's more homogenous in terms of ethnicity, but is still basically a democracy at its base, which requires there to be dialogue and exchange of ideas. So, so maybe this is a little bit of a provocative or sensitive point, um, so you can dodge the answering this question if you'd like, yeah. but for example, that first debate between Trump and Biden, would you say that that's not only, you know, embarrassing, disgusting, you know, everything, everyone reacting the same way, but would you go so far as to say that actually contributes in some way to the, um, radicalization process or the propensity, um, you know, just that negative process that you're describing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, people who support Donald Trump, I mean, there are people who who support him, who, who, who abhorred his behavior. We should we should acknowledge that, uh, you know, I mean, again, people support him for a variety of different reasons. And, and well, it was him. both of them going back and forth is kind of what I'm getting at. Is that display? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah not yeah. just a nuisance. Is it actually dangerous? Yeah, in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I mean, because again, what it does is uh, for a certain percentage of his supporters, it'll basically say, okay, this is the way I need to engage. And I can just, I either just shout over the person, cut them off, don't listen to them, don't make their points. And, um, and, and, and maybe even if it's not about influencing the actual dialogue, because maybe people are not coming in contact with people who disagree with them, um, it'll certainly 
at least normalize the idea that I shouldn't even treat these ideas with any respect whatsoever, and therefore mm. even read articles or, 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 or listen to podcasts or whatever that may challenge some of my, my core values. And so it's dangerous in that regard too. Yeah, that's now the popular thing to do. It's like this weird form of virtue signaling over something that's not a virtue, where people like proudly say, I never once turned the channel to Fox News, or I never once turned the channel to MSNBC or CNN. And they say it with this level of pride. It's like, that's not something to be proud of. Yeah. It's just like, just like you have a food pyramid, you have to have a, a pyramid for your news diet and your sources of information. You've got to, for your own health, you need to have different sources coming in. It's not, don't be proud that you're just eating tuna sandwiches every single day. It's like the equivalent of that to me. Now, uh, before we get to the wrap-up stage of this uh, webinar, um, I got to ask you, what's this thing about you jumping out a window? <laughs> uh, that, that happened quite early on. And, and so in, in the beginning, when I was doing this research, um, especially around 2013-14, I was a little bit more bold in terms of uh, the contacts I made. You know, I went to the turkish syrian border, I met face-to-face -face with members of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and, and even in Spain, I was able to kind of track down extremists and, and foolishly go into their homes uh, and to, to, to do some of these interviews with them face-to-face. -face. And one, and you know, like- the, I, I think you the need most... to work on your propensity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my, 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 my risk aversion needs to become a little bit higher. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, for the most part, they all turned out fine, except for, except for this one instance. Well, the two instances, but one of the instances was I was in this guy's apartment and we were talking and he was, he was an extremist. He had like, you know, he was, he was popular on social media and I think was probably recruiting people to go to Syria. And, uh, and I was in his apartment and there was a couple other guys sitting in the living room I was in his kitchen with him we're having this long conversation and he starts telling, he starts getting really riled up and he starts saying, you know, like, why should, we're speaking in French and he's saying like, why should I even trust you? And, and why should you even, why should I even, you're an American. Uh, why should I even let you out of my, my apartment right now? Why shouldn't I just, you know, kind of take care of you right here, right now? So I had to calm this guy down. And I was like, listen, because you need me, <laughs> you know, like, like I'm, I'm trying to understand you. Um, I'm not gonna do your propaganda for you, but at least I'll be able to represent you in kind of a, a more fair and biased way. Cause right now you're talking to your people and the media's portraying you through their lens. At least you can have one person who's gonna try to give you a fair shake. And he seemed to be somewhat calmed down. And then he kind of got up and went to the left, the uh, kitchen and went into the, the living room with the other two guys. And they were sort of speaking in Arabic. Now I don't speak Arabic, but I do understand a little bit here and there. I can pick up a few words and I could hear the word monophic being repeated again and again. <laughs> and uh, monophic is basically, you know, it can, it, it can mean a uh, hypocrite and it's sort of it's, it's, it's best, but usually what it sort of means is like a fake Muslim a false Muslim. And if you believe in the ideology that these guys believe in, I mean, that's probably, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, uh, that, that means you're, 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 you're an apostate almost basically, you know, like you can get killed and certainly get beat up for it. And that's when I realized, okay, I think I've, I've, I've uh, overstayed my welcome, but luckily there was a window in the kitchen. I was on the second floor. I mean, second European second floor. So by American standards, first floor. So I, I, <laughs> I opened up the uh, the window, and luckily there was a little convenience store underneath me. Climbed out of the window, popped down, uh, knocked over some uh, some some <laughs> some of the, the the convenience store guys' goods, and then just ran like crazy to the to the local train station. Train station. Did they try hunting you down at all? Do you know? I mean, I never heard anything. I didn't really look back. <laughs> so I think it was a few years ago, so I haven't heard anything. I think I'm all right. <laughs> Man, that's an amazing story. So, all right. Well, uh, before we close out, is there any uh, way to keep up with your work? Any plugs you want to make? And also, can you tell people if they want to read some of your studies in English, um, how can they access them? So how can they follow your work and also come across those studies? Yeah, you can follow me on, on Twitter at Nafis Hamid. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search for me on Nafis Hamid. Uh, I'm also on ResearchGate and Academia.edu. If you just search my name, you'll be able to find on both of those platforms. I'm constantly, I, I post uh, any article I put out immediately. So um, you'll be able to follow my research there. Um, 
I, I put out a video in the New York Times that kind of summarized the brain imaging. It's a short video if you want to just watch that. Time Magazine did a longer piece on my colleagues and, and my and, and sort of the, the broader research. A lot of that research is published obviously in academic journals, um, but I also do write in, you know, for like popular press as well. Um, the New York Review of Books and other publications, but you can just, if you just follow me on on any of the social media platforms, basically you'll see me popping up those links or researchgate and academia.edu, you'll be able to see the, the articles that I write uh, pretty immediately. Well, if it was old, they might not see it on your Twitter account, right? So is there something that they should punch into Google in order to look for at least an article summarizing the brain scan uh, experiments? Well, yeah. So for example, we wrote an article called The Neuroscience of Terrorism uh, that was published in The Conversation. And uh, that was kind of that that has the hyperlinks in it to the academic journal articles. If you want just the academic journal articles, I recommend going to Google Scholar and just searching in Google Scholar and you'll be able to see all my publications there. They're all available. The, those are all the academic ones. On ResearchGate and, and, and academia.edu, you'll be able to see the academic articles plus more kind of think tank research pieces as well as popular press pieces. You'll be able to see all the publications. Uh, but the conversation piece, I think, is it's a long form one. I think it's, a, it's, it's probably the most sort of complete article that we've written with all the hyperlinks to all the other studies in it. Great. All right. So thanks so much, Nafiz, for um, giving us so much of your time and really going in depth with us uh, about your experiments. Uh, I know that in short news articles and sometimes those three minute news segments, you don't get to do that. So I think this is a really unique offering for people who want to learn more and some of the advice that you provided is something that all of us can implement in our own lives uh, to not contribute to this negative environment. And if we know radical, I think people are going to be better equipped to handle it because of your work and what you just told us, because the natural impulse is to excommunicate someone. And you're saying that's actually precisely the wrong thing to do. So thank you so much for giving us some of your time and thank you everyone for watching. We wanna thank those that made this webinar possible. Uh, specifically combat anti-Semitism, Muslims facing tomorrow, Canadian citizens against terrorism, uh, also known as CCAT, Canadian Security Research Group, and the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Again, I'm Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project. Sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media so that you can be made aware about the next webinar uh, when we come up with it and we release it and so that you can tune in. This is going to be posted on the internet as well. So make sure you share it on your social media pages, share it with your friends and help get it out there so that we can continue to do these types of events for you. Uh, so again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Nafiz. And uh, everyone have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.